very pleasant afternoon, everybody. Um, for sure, it is my pleasure to uh, share this time with you, and of course, to talk about a very important topic that we all are facing. Um, at the outset, the very takeaway that I'd like to share with you is this very message. Um, any environmental concerns that we're dealing with would really require an understanding of its ecology so that we can have a full understanding on the ecology of its solution. And that's precisely the case with the framework such as EcoHealth. So, if we're going to take a look at uh, the importance of EcoHealth in Southeast Asia, um, we can clearly show how important is the operationalization of this framework, given that you are considering Southeast Asia as the hotspot for a number of diseases, and this is particularly for zoonotic diseases. And there are a number of factors why is this so. Uh, this would cover the physical characters of the, of the region um, by virtue of its tropical condition, which is very conducive for the spread of such diseases through a number of factors. And at the same time, you can look into social and economic factors inherent in this or peculiar in this particular region. So clearly, there are a number of factors related to animal health and at the same time related to human health. Our focus today would be primarily on a number of zoonotic diseases that are actually in the interface between the animal health and then the human, human health. Now, this is very critical due to a number of um, challenges towards emerging zoonotic diseases. We can name a number of um, factors related to this. One would be on the globalization and international trade. We also have for forest habitat alteration, agricultural intensification, urbanization, climate change. So there's plethora of factors uh, related to this. Um, and we can actually, I mean, we are very familiar with a number of this. But the manifestation as to how these are related to zoonotic diseases is something that we need to actually clarify. So the attribution of the emergence of disease in relation to a number of these factors would be very inherently necessary for our purpose. Now, we need to situate where are we when we talk about zoonotic diseases. And that actually begs uh, the question on clarifying the issue on scale, particularly on zoonotic diseases. And in here, if we're going to take a look, very important is the concern on, this, on, on, on the scale, which will cover the temporal aspect and then on the spatial scale. In environmental science, particularly in, in CESA, we're very much into a number of these different types of systems. And we're reminded by, uh, with, with the theory provided by Autumn, that when we look at the environment, we need to look at it as a system. And with the complexity of the natural environment, there has to be a way for us to subdivide it into, into a particular system that we can work on. And then that covers then our levels of hierarchical organization, which, cut, which cuts across from the individual level up to the ecosystem level and up to the biosphere. Now, very important for us to focus is to actually look into the disease and clarify at what particular level it is occurring so that we can then understand at what particular level of our hierarchical organization what are where are the causes on it and then where are the manifestations of its effects actually so in here for instance most of our diseases would occur at the individual at the population and then at the community level but what we are arguing here is there are a number of factors actually in the larger systems that could directly affect what happens at the community or population or at the individual level. On the other hand, we are also arguing that what I mean, a number of the causes are actually done at the individual level. So therefore, the causes of it and then what drives it are actually done by individuals, for instance. But the manifestations of a number of these diseases can be better appreciated at a larger scale, which happens maybe at the ecosystem level and then at the same time at the last landscape or even at the biospheric level. Now, we're, we're not much aware with that kind of approaches. So therefore, in this case, there are a number of views and there are a number of perspectives on a particular disease or a particular concern. And that adds up to the complexity of how we proceed with the solutions on the identified problems. Now, it, so, so therefore, it's a very complicated matter. On the other hand, 
a number of these diseases, in terms of manifestation, it is actually very slow. Um, the contribution of one agent, for instance, on an ecological problem that manifests at the ecosystem level is very complicated. And there's temporal dimension, there's time lag that we need to appreciate. And sometimes a number of the factors of the disease would actually manifest at the extreme level as well. So we know how, I mean, we know that these are the factors, but at the same time, the frameworks and the theories that we are looking into are are not that fully developed, much more on the openness of a number of our colleagues, perhaps need further enha enhancements so we can strengthen our identification of the disease and then the solution making as well. That could start with a number of models that we can look into. So let's say, for instance, in this case, if you're interested in a disease, a very simplistic model would be to look into the infection and to look into the pathogens. In one way or the other, you could be an expert on the infection, some of us could be an expert on the pathogen, some would be interested on the disease. But when we look at the echo health or using the echo health lens, we are actually trying to identify a number of those models. And you and I could have a specific models on that particular disease. And therefore, that one would require us to actually enter into sort of a debate or comparison of what would be but not really what would be the best, but rather a comparison of what would be the most appropriate models in that particular context. So the appreciation of the context, therefore, is very important, but much more is the openness and then the availability of those models all across um, the given context. So this is just one of the models. In the case of emerging zoonotic uh, pathogens, we're looking at it now not merely as a disease, we're looking at it as an ecological phenomenon. When there's a disease, for instance, in an individual, that is not just simply caused by the physiological characteristic of that individual. We are, from, from echo health lens, we're trying to argue that that is because of the ecological condition where that individual is, I mean, formed part. Now, that, uh, the ability to see what is happening on that individual at the ecosystem perspective is part of the challenge and we also argue that part of the reason why we are not fully understanding it because of the gap in terms of the disease occurrence of an individual and what are the factors that actually caused it that need to be understood at the ecosystem level. So a number of these drivers of the diseases could be traced to a number of phenomena at the ecosystem level. So the disease emergence, for instance, would include land use change, so very, very broad um, human movement, another very broad um, dynamics. You also have encroachment and wildlife translocation. And then you also have another broader concept to look into, which is climate change, among others. You also have a number of social phenomenon um, at play as well. But in here, this, this phenomenon that happens at, or this phenomenon that happened at the ecosystem level are clearly interlinked on a number of diseases that occur or that may manifest in that particular individual. And these processes influencing transmission of zoonotic pathogens can be described as a consequence of one or a combination of a number of, of factors. So you can look into what is the contribution of the expansion of the habitat or geographic range of the host, or a pathogen, or both. And then you relate that, for example, to the expansion of humans' habitat or geographic range. So conversion of forests into a number of human settlements. Um, change in the habitat or ecosystem occupied by both humans and then the natural host. So there are a number of factors to look into. And in one way or, that or, a, or another, these major drivers of change actually could be related to a number of diseases that we are concerning with, such as the case of malaria. Um, Lyme disease, liver fluke, and a, num a number of waterborne diseases. So when we talk about EcoHealth, we're trying to integrate the ecology and environmental change. And this is very important because a number of 75, uh, about 75% of emerging infectious diseases are actually um, zoonotic diseases. And they are spread from animals to humans, from natural host pathogen cycles in nature, which precisely happens at the ecosystem level. 
Now, what we want here is to also couple our understanding on this disease with the social and ecological factors, or a number of forces, and a number of mechanisms that operate from the level of microbial genetic adaptation to land use transformation, even up to regional environmental change, um, not to mention globalization. So you have here your agroecosystem, you have your natural ecosystems, and you have your human ecosystem. When we talk about the disease in usual uh, perspective, you look at the disease at that particular population or community level. We want to expand the interactions, I mean, the understanding of these diseases by looking into the interactions between the human ecosystems and the natural ecosystems. And using this perspective, you can look into what we call as the host vector ecological and evolutionary cross landscape transition. So the temporal or the evolution of that particular ecosystem through time could give us or could shed us um, a, a better understanding of the emergence of that disease and hopefully in the future even predict it. Now this is a framework that we are very interested. So for instance at the larger scale you are talking with population, technological capacity or social cultural organization. This may change in context but we want to take note that these are important things to look into. And with this, this could have, I mean, manifest or could actually influence the kind of urbanization that is present in an area. And the agricultural intensification and then the habitat alteration. So you have your human ecosystem here and then you have your natural ecosystem here. And then you see what would happen between your human ecosystem and then the natural ecosystem in each levels of your hierarchical organization. So for instance, at the landscape level of organization, what is happening in that landscape level would be species, ecological, evolutionary dynamics. So this is where you would understand vector, reserva, wildlife, transport, feral reserva species, or human encroachment, among other phenomena, that is present at the landscape level of organization. Um, Within this particular system, you also have your community level of organization. Someone may be doing the research in that aspect, but we understand that this is clearly related to what is happening at the community level. At the community level of organization, this is where your host pathogen dynamics, as an example, would occur. So that would give you um, the emergence processes of host parasite biology. So example for what is happening here is post switching, transmission modification, and genetic exchange, among others. Now you connect, someone will do an understanding on this, someone will do research on this, and at the same time, someone will, will be interested on the disease emergence. But then again, when you look at disease emergence, this actually would require an understanding on the continuum, continu continuum between human ecosystem and then the natural ecosystem, an understanding of each of the levels of hierarchical organization as to how this contributes to the disease emergence. This disease emergence could be better appreciated at the ecosystem level or it could be better appreciated at the population or at the community level. Now are there evidences that support this particular idea? So there has been a study that clearly linked urbanization and then the social ecology to the emergence of infectious diseases. So they were able to prove that a number of these zoonotic diseases actually amplified or in, were intensified because of urbanization, because of a number of um, environmental change that is present in an area. Now, not all health professionals are interested on, on this. But we are trying to somehow expand the way we define what is health. And then the incorporation of the concept of ecology and environmental science in the way we define and the way we appreciate and the way we look into health would be very necessary. So therefore, that leads us to the concept on eco-health. So from there, there has been a number of interventions to control zoonotic diseases. While there are considerable successes on this, but the cyclical nature has been, well, it's cyclical, so it keeps on returning and returning, 
and it actually would evolve into something that our earlier tested approaches may not be successful. So it morphed into something that is new and that could be expected as well because our system would actually evolve eventually. But what perhaps this one is lacking is the understanding of the very nature. This is where your ecology of understanding would be very necessary so you can have an ecology of solutions of your zoonotic diseases. Now in EcoHealth, you have to always remember a multi-level ecosystem approach. So this cannot be done by a single professional or a single researcher or even a single laboratory or research laboratory. Therefore, you may have like a bigger organization that would cover a number of ecosystem types and then a number of research work covering a number of phenomena in each of these ecosystem types. So indeed, a multi-level ecosystem approach is necessary. So you may need projects or combinations of projects or research programs or combinations of research programs. What is far more important is the incorporation of ecological theory and then data. Now this requires framework that would actually cover a number of disciplines. This requires a certain level of communication that transcends a number of disciplines. So we may communicate in different ways, but we need to find a common language that would then arrive us at a, at a considerable framework for us to get started with our work and to hopefully um, allow us to come up with initial hypotheses, our frameworks in there, and then that will then guide our research design, which will then guide the kind of data that we will be collecting. Now, when we talk about EcoHealth, this is not just simply about um, the technical aspect of it. So there's so much work about it because we're trying to understand the social ecology of a number of these concerns. So here, you also would look into the local scale intervention. And this is where participatory approaches would be very necessary. This is not easy work. Um, sometimes uh, this would require a number of social preparations and engagements. But in, in EcoHealth, we look into the importance of, of participatory approaches in conjunction with a number of researches or understanding on, on these two levels. So together, EcoHealth is a holistic approach. You look into human health, but you do not just simply define a disease in terms of or in relation to the physiological characteristic of, of the patient. But you look at the disease by, by integrating humans, animals, and then the environment as one. I know it is not easy, but but that's a good start, uh, a good basis for our discussion. Um, this approach would aim towards an understanding on the risks on animal health through coordination of the human-animal ecosystem interface applied across different levels. So this is not the usual um, research that we're doing. Oftentimes, or more often than not, this is actually a transdisciplinary study. A transdisciplinary approach would be necessary to address public health issues attributable to environmental conditions and learning, as well as on social conditions than on biomedical variables. So, in the starting, um, in the early phases of EcoHealth as a framework, it was actually um, designed by the disease ecologists. And then they realize that they need to actually linkage, uh, link uh, the ecosystem, the society, and then the health, and then the animals, and then the humans. So this one um, covers these three key principles, transdisciplinarity, participatory, and equity. Now when you embark on transdisciplinary approach, this is not something that we can um, finish right away, and then if we have publication, that's the end of it. This one is very much pragmatic, and then this one would need us to look into the appropriate scale. It may be at the local scale, and then you relate that with higher scales. And on the intervention, 
this one would be on the bottom up um, approach. Now, in the understanding of the disease using EcoHealth, you would look into a number of factors that affect health and well-being, and as to how these are related to each other uh, in a multi-dimensional web. According to Unger, there are key principles that we need to look into so we can really operationalize EcoHealth. First is systems thinking. You have knowledge to action approach, transdisciplinarity, participation, equity, and sustainability. So let's talk about this one one by one so we can elaborate the theory behind ecosystem health. So first is systems thinking, where you look into the linkage between the interactions uh, among the elements that make up a system. So it starts with defining the appropriate system which is related to the appropriate scale of what caused the disease so that these two would also have a better idea on how to solve it. So scale is very important as seen in a system's perspective. So you both look into the time scale, the spatial scale, among other factors. On the other hand, um, you have to have a better approach in the, in the defining of the boundaries of the system the delineation of the system. In a number of environmental problems, the boundary is, is clear, it's physical. But in a number of situations, the boundaries are, are not. But, but therefore, when you design your studies, you need to clarify at what particular scale you're looking at the particular problem. And at the same time, you choose between inclusivity and feasibility based on time, skills, and capacity. So this is more of the practical aspect but on the other hand, we are reminded that you look first into the ecological dimension of what caused the disease, and that must be the very basis of um, the definition of our system. Second principle is knowledge to action. Meaning, when, when we produce ideas, it's not simply just about, or we do not just simply concern ourselves with the publication of it, as a researcher, we're not just expected to generate information. We're trying to push ourselves a bit further here. We are actually trying to produce cadre of researchers that are good technically, but at the same time, they are conscious to make sure that the information that they're producing are actually being used to really improve health and to really contribute to well-being through an improved environment. Now, whatever knowledge that we will generate, there are a number of models that you can also use in this one, and you can prove, um, you, you can proceed actually in various ways. One is you can look into the relationship between science and policies. You can look into how science informs policies, science how it could change policies, so on and so forth. And at the same time, you can look into how policymakers would gain new knowledge from the research. So, but basically, what we want here is when you talk about EcoHealth, this is this would really require knowledge to action research. The third one is transdisciplinarity. So you have a comprehensive vision of that particular disease in terms of what caused it, as seen at the appropriate level covering different views and perspectives. So therefore, an EcoHealth team would cover a number of disciplines, and at the same time, not just the technical experts, not just the scientists, but also the local experts. So you will talk about the interest groups, and then at the same time with the policy actors. When you talk about interdisciplinarity, you look into the evolution of the integration of research methods, and then the tools, across disciplines, which would include non-academic perspective and local knowledge. Transdisciplinarity is a very difficult um, approach to really operationalize, but, but there are attempts to actually make this happen. You can start with your multi and your interdisciplinarity until you reach the transdisciplinarity. But in one way or the other, the very barrier for me is actually the way we are being trained. 
But at the same time, we need to correct our perspective on this because what's common among us is actually the disease. When we are inherent in our respective discipline, but we want to be in a position to really know the strengths of our discipline at the level that we can even question the limitations of our discipline. So you'll be in a position to actually reach out and be open to other disciplines. And such level of realization would be very necessary starting point for the operationalization of transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity. Now, this kind of research would also require scientists or researchers who are not just simply good with data collection or technical aspect. We are at a particular time wherein scientists are expected to be socially sensitive as well. So this would require a wide range of skills um, that would be necessary, not just simply those that are covered in our academic training, but we need researchers who can communicate to people very well, you know, um, who can facilitate uh, consensus building, who can really communicate, who can transform technical knowledge and present it in a, in a more convincing and easier, easier way. Now, let me zero in on this one because this is something that perhaps UPLB as a community, or in Southeast Asia, this is something that we can work on. And we can question ourselves as to how we can then operationalize transdisciplinarity. The way we're being trained, you look into encyclopedic um, understanding, okay? and then, or reflection in action. There could be different, um, there could be different questions from different disciplines but there could be commonalities and therefore there could be common motivations on that particular discipline. So you ask the question, what is the purpose of inter- and transdisciplinary research? In our case, that could be our research. And then when you understand that, you look into the development of an understanding that accounts for complexity and diversity. And then at the same time, you look into the solutions. In ECOGA, when you want to understand what caused it and you want to also solve it, that would require a solution and that would also require the science behind it. And in terms of perspective, that could look into holistic perspective and at the same time on the problem solving. So, in here, when you talk about transdisciplinary research necessary for the operationalization of Echo help. We start with this disciplinary approach. So you bring in all the members of necessary disciplines in your team and with their respective biases, and then they come up with their respective um, observations um, guided with their respective questions. This is how we are being trained. In the case of multidisciplinarity, we try to clarify a common objective. And then perhaps from there, you let each of the disciplines come up with their, or to proceed and to still use their own um, specific approaches and tools and techniques. In the, on the other hand, in the case of interdisciplinarity, you still look into a common objective, but you look into a common framework and therefore common tools. And in the discussion of, I mean, in the understanding of the particular problem, and therefore, in the analysis, that would then look into the combinations of these different disciplines. Now, we are trying to be best in multidisciplinary, and we're trying to be best in interdisciplinary approach. These are good starting point for for eco health, but at the same time, our our tools and techniques are still limited on this one, but. But this is, uh, this is a good start. On the other hand, what we are looking into is the case of transdisciplinary research. This is very tricky, as you can see. You have an observation. You still have your different disciplines. But in here, when we try to define a problem and when we pose a particular question, this is not really biased on one particular discipline alone. But this is a combination 
of all of those disciplines that it would be very difficult for you to actually clearly identify, or not, that's not the goal, to clearly identify which discipline is in there. And therefore, the tools and the techniques that we are coming up is therefore in a higher level scale which combines all of those disciplines. So there's a new discipline that would be necessary to simplify things. In the case of EcoHealth, this is how we're supposed to actually um, come up with all of our approaches. So this is the evolution of, uh, say this is the number of years that we will look into. Now, in the, in, the, in the designing of your study, you start with your transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary lens. And therefore, in the identification of the problems and in the identification of your, of your methodologies, in one way or the other, we want it to be guided or in support to transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. So that could be your year one up to year two or in the first stages of your work. <coughs> On year two and year three, or in the, in the ensuing years, this is the time that you actually would let your specific team members to work on their specific disciplines, to utilize or to employ the like, specific tools that they have. And then at the same time, you need to go back to your transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach. And at the same time, the solution aspect that should cover these different approaches. So, we're not saying either or, but we're trying to be aware as to what particular phases in our eco health implementation, a particular approach would be very necessary. Now, in each of the approach, you would then look into the understanding of the perspectives from different disciplines that could cover the social processes, um, the higher interability would be necessary for this one. Or you can look into the quantification of a number of variables. So here, this one would be very necessary. So we cannot say an eco health is purely quantitative in approach. It's highly contextual. So therefore, the context actually determines what we would or how we will proceed. Now that is very difficult because sometimes we are very much biased in our disciplinary um, background. But then again. The context is very necessary for the designing of our projects. Okay. Now, this is not an easy part, okay? but as a good reminder, when we approach this one, this is not a question of either or or, but this is a question of when and this is a question of which. So, what particular research question is appropriate in this particular context and therefore what particular method would be upgraded in this particular context. An echo app cannot just be implemented by the researchers or the scientists alone. This would require participation and that's the third important element. There are different concepts as to how participation could be achieved, but at a minimum, this is necessary to achieve consensus and cooperation. So this could start um, in terms of the identification of what is the research question, this one could start by looking into the perspective of the community members in terms of how they define the problem. On the other hand, this would also be done in terms of how your data would be collected and how it would be analyzed. And therefore, this would also be, participation could also be done in terms of what could be the solutions um, that would be identified and as to how it would be identified. So there are different ways how to operationalize participation. But then again, when you talk about participation, this is not simply the researchers alone. Okay? The researchers in there are expected to facilitate. And so in here, participation would be necessary for the identification of the boundaries, the recognition of the existing barriers to change, and then to provide options to move forward. The fourth one is about gender and social equity. So you look into the respective roles of men and women and various social groups. So it's not just simply about your data disaggregated between men 
or male and female. That's not the way we approach it. You look into gender, you look into social, cultural um, roles that is uh, inherent in that, uh, in that area. And this is very important because a number of um, the way we define disease, for instance, and the way we look to the solutions of a particular disease, that is very much related to gender and very much related to inherent social inequity. At the same time, we look into women uh, that is already very well, influential, and women could have major responsibilities on, on health, actually, of a number of the families. So when women is very central on the way we look at the disease. And on the other hand, if we're going to look into the case of the women, there's a recognition that currently women have little power on household income allocation, and that could actually enhance or actually that affected the kind of disease that we have. Now, since you're talking about system and you're talking about disease, the very important element ultimately is about the concept of sustainability. So, in there, when you deal with diseases, it's not just simply about coming up with a solution and then preventing the disease. You're trying to fully understand the system and then make sure that the system is not just simply um, being able to respond to smaller disturbances, but actually your system being able to actually reach a particular point that is, you know, su could sustain the characteristic of that uh, uh, the characteristic of that system through time. So eco health aimed towards sustainability, wherein every action is ethical, efficient, environmentally sound, and at the same time socially acceptable. In short-term needs, it might not be consistent with the long-term process for health, but the best eco health approach is to actually be able to provide the short-term needs but also to define the diseases in response to a long-term perspective. So what we're saying here is it's good to prevent the disease, but we're also asking the question how, I mean, how can we make sure that the system will actually not be facing the, the same kind of diseases in the future or a new kind of diseases that have morphed from the earlier diseases that were present. Okay, so those were the principles. Now, for our discussion today, we'll try to see how can we then operationalize this because this is not easy. You know? I'm discussing things actually at a very broad scale and I know in one way or the other, the next question is how can we then operationalize this? How can we merge together different points of view? And then if we're going to implement a Kugel that is using holistic perspective, what is its value added, actually? Um, would we deal with this in a better way because we're using it well? There are several attempts in Southeast Asia that look into this. <clears throat> in practice, um, this work used by a number of, a number of um, organizations. And part of the Greece network, um, this one, which is actually by Sirad, so this is a French organization. Um, Greece is a research network that is um, interested on the analysis of emerging diseases in, in Southeast Asia particularly. But there are also a number of uh, comparable platforms in different parts of the world. In here, you look at the, you, you change the way you define risks. Okay? And here you incorporate concepts on risks on the way you you define disease, and therefore you also incorporate that in the way you define, you come up with your solutions. As a network, um, Greece is based in Kazakhstan University. There are a number of um, activities that we are doing, co covering research up to extension work, and then up to some then training, and then. We're looking also into the identification, the exploration of a number of tools or techniques that is responsive to multi interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach. At the same time, it looks into 
the strengthening of collaboration among different research organizations and universities, as well as with um, government agencies. And it focused on the production of theoretical and operational frameworks that integrates disciplines and interest groups. So this is something that perhaps a work in progress, but as a model, this is something that we can also learn so that at least in the Philippine perspective, for instance, we can look into how we can then really operationalize EcoHealth, not from the perspective of one research laboratory, but as but as a country, for instance, or as a university to make it even more operational. One example for this kind of project that was implemented by Greece is called Come Across. So Come Across uh, means companion approach for cross-sectoral collaboration in health risk management in Southeast Asia. Now, there's a um, methodological framework that this particular uh, research work is using, it's called companion modeling. So in here, companion modeling is a methodological framework that involves a number of disciplines and that involves a number of interest groups, including policy makers or a number of government agencies. But as a project, Come Across was interested, one, on the improvement on, in terms of the awareness on One Health or Echo Health, and as to the best practices on this. But it starts with frameworks and mechanisms. Okay, so these are the kind of researches that do not just simply, I mean, that's not interested on the coming up with values. It's about the coming up of the frameworks, tools, and then the approaches, and then the testing of, of those. On the other hand, also on the improvement of the vocational competencies. So meaning we're talking about new researchers, researchers that are actually more sensitive are more open on holistic approaches. And at the same time, and then here, the way this is being operationalized, um, it produces post-graduate students, or it trains graduate students, and it produces um, graduates with capacities on the assessment and management of risks okay, across these different animal environment, human health, Interfaces, and one program that we have is interest uh, master degree. Okay, so you can also participate on on the interest uh, master degree. So this is also open um, every year. I'm not so sure until when, but this is at least one way to operationalize um, Echo Health. The other very famous in the literature and in the practice is actually the case of liver fluke um, in, in northern Thailand. In here, there were two prevailing views as to how liver fluke um, could be understood and how it could be solved. The first one is the reductionist view of the liver fluke. So in here, very specific, right? And there were a number of diseases uh, sorry, a number of um, interventions that were implemented as informed by the reductionist approach. On the other hand, contrast that with the holistic view of that particular disease. And in here, if you look into the current condition, these diseases actually were, were controlled after that holistic view of the way it was understood and then the solutions. And you know, the very key solution in there is actually the cultural, uh, the food practice of, 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 of the community. So it was not, well, the, the technical understanding of it was very important, but the solution was not solely on the technical, but it, it was very cultural in nature. So that's one, one case of our interest. The third one is the coupled natural human systems and then emerging infectious diseases, such as for the case of avian influenza in the case of Vietnam. So there were a number of technical experts that were invited to provide an understanding on this. But what was lacking was actually on the ecological lens of the disease. And then they paved the way for what they call as the Wilcox-Gobler-Cobel hypothesis. 
In here, they argued that the risk and then the perceptions of risks associated with HPA1 were caused by this particular virus, which resulted to, uh, to poultry deaths. This can then be associated with anthropogenic environmental changes. And then this could be traced back to urbanization, agricultural change, and natural habitat alteration. If you look into the, um, into the literature, these were actually absent. Um, the ecological explanations of the disease were actually not, uh, not highlighted, but this, um, this study actually connected the dots on what is happening at the, at the landscape or the ecological level to what is happening at um, the farm. So one data that they pro provided is actually this one. So if you look into this, um, the diseases, the emergence of the disease could then be related to um, land and the rice, for instance. So you have a number of variables that are related to land use change. Now in their conclusion, um, the highly pathogenic avian influenza could now be better understood in terms of the ecological characteristic. So therefore, the ecological, so, so therefore, this avian influenza could be better understood as an environmental phenomenon. Okay. So there are a number of um, good learnings that they've provided and a number of applications have been um, produced to further enlighten us on the ecological aspects of the disease. Now from those um, case studies, there are a number of takeaways that we can actually learn. The first one is the appropriate ecosystem scale. This is a very important lesson for us because when we have a disease, for instance, we need to actually look into the ecological basis of that particular disease. So first and foremost, we need to then define the appropriate ecosystem scale to better understand drivers of that disease, how it emerged, the transition, and then the spread. The next challenge will be <clears throat> on the testing and in the developing of innovative research approaches, frameworks, and tools. I know you and I are very much trained to learn a particular tool, but we are also, we need to be also interested on how we can then integrate a number of specific tools, how we can then combine it to come up with a methodological framework, given that we're dealing with complex problems. So we also need researchers who would question the kind of methods that we're using and at the same time to also produce new methodological techniques and, and frameworks. So that, those were, that one is also another very important um, learning. The other one is to strengthen support for academic and public services engagements in research, extension work, and of course um, on policy. And this is given, uh, this is expected given uh, the framework of EcoHealth. While this may not be uh, the direct responsibility of the researchers, but with good research work that we will be doing, and we can show that there is value addition on this as government agency, agencies can clearly utilize our work, we can expect that it would actually encourage more support for research work, and at the same time to also um, invite more um, government agencies to to send up in more participants. The third one is strengthen support for academic and public services in engagements in research. Okay, the, the next is improve coordination and communication system among relevant stakeholders. So gone are the days that when we talk about um, our findings, there, there's also another kind of science or discipline that would be necessary to actually transform our knowledge and information being produced into something that would be meaningful for policymakers or decision makers to, to appreciate. There's a need also for more capacity building programs and research activities, particularly in linking epidemiology and in the social ecology of diseases. 
this one will start from your framework to the kind of research questions that you produce, to the kind of methodological framework that you employ, and to the way you collect your data and the way you will analyze your data. On the other hand, there is also a need for us to understand um, the economic costs of the diseases as the basis for decisions. And then to further show that EcoHealth is very important, we want to link EcoHealth with other food security concerns, okay, such as um, particularly in, in the case of food safety. The list could be long, but by looking into where we are now in Southeast Asia, these are the major takeaways that perhaps you and I could look into. And in this particular context, CIRCA, CIRAD, and UPLB initiated a One Health platform. So we're still working on this one. But um, as a starting point, CIRAD and CIRCA will be coming up with a training. This is a training workshop on applications of One Health and EcoHealth approach towards sustainable livestock production in Southeast Asia. And it will be on October 23 and 25 um, this year here in in Circa. So if you'll be interested, the knowledge management uh, unit of of Circa um, is interested on this. Okay, so that's the that, that's where we are in terms of EcoHealth in Southeast Asia, along with the case studies. So thank you very much for your time.